Hi, welcome to the third and final part of my Lorraine L38 Ambulance series. Today I'll be taking this Lorraine Ambulance, which I built in part one and painted and weathered in part two, and I'll be combining it with these soldiers from Masterbox to create this diorama. So the first thing I did was construct the figures. I haven't shown a lot of this in the video because it was straightforward. Uh, there were no major issues with these Masterbox figures. Some small pieces here and there like around the waist that needed to be filled but nothing major. And they've got a really really good amount of detail on them. And the poses in particular look very good. They All, all the soldiers look like they're really struggling to carry this uh, sheet where their wounded uh, comrade is. See this guy here, you can really sort of see straight away that that, that um, left hand there is going to be holding the sheet there. Really, really good poses, really happy with those. I've just blue tacked the arms on for now because those are the inside arms which uh, will be positioned according to the sheet. And here the wounded soldier fits perfectly inside the sheet as well. You'll notice here that the hands are um, attached to the sheet so each of those soldiers will need their inside hand chopping off so that it can be attached directly to the, the sheet, the stretcher. And if you look at the spruce for a moment, um, the detail in all the equipment, the, the water bottles, the entrenching tools, the weapons, everything's really good. There's no flash on here whatsoever. Really, really clear moulding. Great job from Masterbox. They even give you a choice of helmets for a couple of the uh, figures as well. So the first thing I did was paint all of the figures in um, NATO Black XF69 and the set I'm going to be using to paint these is Vallejo's German Field Grey set which is a collection of eight colours and you can use these to create all kinds of variations of German uniform from the blues and the dark greys to the greens and everything in between. It's a, it's a really, really nice set. Uh, I've only used three of the colours and those three are the olive green the field grey and the uh, bronze green. So this image is familiar to a lot of modelers. This just shows the variety of colours of German uniforms uh, which are out there. Everything from sort of a, a bluey green in the top left down to a, a grey brown in the bottom right and, and everything in between depending on the materials and the dyes that are used and the exposure to the elements and so on. So I'm looking for a nice variety in the four soldiers or the five soldiers I'm going to paint. So this is Vallejo's uh, Field Grey, which is quite a light grey colour. It looks like, a little bit like it's going to represent fady fabric, but it will darken later on when it's washed and when it gets varnished and so on. Uh, in this particular figure I actually painted the tunic and the trousers the same colour, but for the rest of them I tried to mix it up a little bit. So this guy's getting a Field Grey tunic. And this is the olive green colour. Again, it looks slightly bright now, but it will tone down nicely. And then this jacket is in the bronze green colour, which is really quite a dark colour, and once it's had a wash and a varnish as well, it comes out the darkest of these three colours. So you can see here with the bronze green trousers and the field grey top, it does look a little bit more realistic than just having the entire figure all in one colour. And especially once the ammunition pouches and the canteen and the gas mask container are all painted, that will help to break it up a little bit as well. Uh, and then for a little bit more variety, I happen to have a little bit of Tamiya's XF65 field green left over, so I just used that. It's quite similar to Vallejo's olive green, but it does have a slightly different shade. Okay, and here are the figures with the base coat, and you can see there's a good variety there. That's um, Tamiya field green top and bronze green trousers. And then here's the wounded soldier. I actually changed his trousers to green. I, d I didn't like the field grey all over. I really like the very dark tones of this bronze green tunic on this figure. So once the uniforms were painted, I went on to do the flesh. 
Initially I painted them with base flesh from AK Interactive and then I went over that with uh, light flesh to do the highlights. And at this point there's only one hand to paint for each soldier because I've chopped off their hand which will be attached to the uh, stretcher. And of course the flesh painting includes these four uh, ghost hands which are attached to the sheet. So they're painted in the same way, base flesh with uh, light flesh highlights. And then once the flesh had dried it was time just to do the accessories. So some light sort of sandy brown colours for the entrenching tool handles. I like the way this figure's carrying his in his belt rather than uh, uh, in the proper uh, place. And then a variety of browns for the, the satchels, the ammunition pouches and so on. Gas mask containers I did in a variety of colours. Some I did more or less entirely in steel to suggest that sort of uh, paint had been worn away. Others I did uh, in a sort of a field green colour and then just a little bit of uh, small steel chips on them. And once I gave what turned out to be quite a heavy gloss coat to the figures, um, I used some um, artist oils, burnt umber, mixed with enamel thinner, to really about a 90% thinner to 10% paint ratio. And I'm just giving each of the figures now a little bit of a, a wash. Try and create some depth in the trousers and the uniforms, even in the face as well. Rather than painting eyes uh, and mouths and so on, a little bit of the wash can sort of highlight those features. And I applied the same wash to the really nice folds in the fabric that the sheet has. And so after letting the oil paints dry for a, a good 24 hours, I just went back to each of the figures and I used the same original uh, colour paint just to paint some highlights. The reason that this paint now looks like a highlight tone is because the original paints had that filter of um, burnt umber, so it's darkened. It's also had the varnish, so it's darkened as well. So actually painting the same colour over the top does give a slight highlight tone. So these trousers were originally painted in bronze green, and now it's exactly what I'm painting on top, bronze green again. Just in the raised areas, just really where the light's falling. And another way to do virtually the same thing is basically to do a, almost like a dry brush technique as well. So here are the five figures after the oil paints have been applied and after the highlights have been added. The highlights are really quite subtle, you can't see them so well, but if you compare them to a previous image, uh, they are there. Quite happy with the way these guys have turned out. They've been given a matte varnish as well and they probably needed another one I would say. They're not quite matte enough yet. And so the last thing to do for these figures is to dirty them up a little bit more and to do that I'm going to use some pigments. So I'm just adding some pigment here. This is uh, Cursed Girth. It's quite a dark brown and I'm applying it quite heavily on top of the shoes and then just blending it up towards the knees where obviously it's a little bit thinner. Generally speaking I'm not putting much pigment or if any pigment above the knees but I am putting some on certain patches so for example uh, maybe some dark patch on the elbows where they've likely been in the ground um, perhaps some actual patches on the front of the knees as well. basically just to make it look like these trousers have been worn for a good number of days. So the tricky bit of this was getting the four figures attached simultaneously to the stretcher. So I figured the best way to do this was to put a little bit of styrofoam under the stretcher 
to uh, give it a little bit of height and then try to super glue each of these figures on one by one and hopefully if each one is held in place with some super glue this should be a relatively easy thing to do luckily the terrain on the diorama itself is quite flat so I don't have to worry about uh, different heights for the figures but obviously they need to be pointing in the same direction roughly and so on so a good tip for any glue if you've got a very small contact area is to use something like a cocktail stick or a, the end of a skewer just to put a drop of glue on there just needs holding until it's stable. Okay, and having left the super glue to dry for some time, it seems that that idea has worked so far. So here we have the stretcher and each of the four figures attached fairly sturdily to the sides. So that should make putting them onto the diorama a little easier. And there's our wounded soldier. So I tried a variety of wooden bases to try and find one that was just right. I always think the best thing to do with the wooden base is to make it as small as possible but no smaller. So this square one and this round one didn't really give enough uh, room. I didn't want anything much bigger. So in the end I ended up using this uh, picture frame. And I'm going to have some kind of road going diagonally across on the left hand side here and then some kind of grass on the right hand side. And the figures are going to be walking towards the ambulance carrying the stretcher. Now I need enough room for the figures, but what I don't want to do is put the ambulance um, parallel to any of the edges. Anytime you have something like that, it, it, the diorama just doesn't look right, so I need some kind of angle going on for the ambulance. And equally, uh, the soldiers need to be walking in at some kind of angle as well. They don't want to be parallel to the edges. So I tried a few variations and this was the one that I settled upon in the end. So for the grass part of the diorama I'm going to use this grass mat from Model Scene. It's a really really nice grass mat. I gave it a comparison with the one from Dio Brothers in a recent video. And as you can see I've chopped a few bits of it already for our previous dioramas. So though this mat is only A4 it actually lasts quite a long time. And I'm just going to have a little bit going on the right hand side here for that diagonal grass part that I mentioned before. I'm just going to cut this mat so it roughly goes across like so. One of the problems of using these angles with dioramas you always end up with strange offcuts but there's not much I can do about that. So this is roughly how it's going to look. Uh, the area here where the soldiers are walking is going to be grass. The area to the left is going to be a road and that area between, in between is going to be sort of a, a bank, not a, a steep bank, but it's just the, basically the blending of the mud for the road and the grass. So I cut the grass mat to shape, and then it's just a case of sticking it down and just making sure it goes right down the edges as well. The straight edges here on the grass mat um, where it meets the road don't matter because they'll be blended in later so I don't need to worry about that. And then once that was roughly the right shape I just glued it down with some PVA glue. So for the road itself I just mixed up some sculptor mould, I just made sure I covered all of the remaining uh, part of the wooden frame, getting it right up to the edges. It doesn't matter if it goes on the wooden frame because it's easy to remove uh, before it dries at least. I just made sure it went all the way up to the grass and actually also overlapped the grass a little bit as well. 
Once the sculpted mold is down, you can just use a little bit of water to smooth it out. I wanted it reasonably smooth, but with some indications of ruts where uh, wheels and tracks might have been on the road. So while I'm doing this, I'm trying to remember scale. So a 135 scale, if I have a, a 10 millimeter sort of bump of wood, that is actually 35 centimeters, so over a foot, which is more than I really want. So I'm just trying to keep the, the variations to within a few millimeters. And then once the sculptor mold had dried, I just used some regular artist's acrylic paint just to cover this. It's thinned with water. This is uh, burnt umber, if I remember correctly. And all I'm trying to do here is just cover every piece of white from the sculptor mold. It needs quite a thick layer in places because the sculptor mold absorbs water. But this is not going to be my final road surface. This is just in case anything from above breaks off. I don't want to see white below it. So I'm making sure I go right up to the edge, every little piece of white covered. And it's a good idea as well to look at it from different angles, make sure there's no white bits exposed when you're looking in a different direction. And then you can see as I, as I was getting ready for the next step, I actually broke off this piece of sculptor mold here. There's a little white patch here and there, um, but I can fix that in the next step anyway. So the main thing I'm using for the terrain is going to be this from Vallejo. Uh, it's their um, acrylic thick mud. It's a really nice product, lasts quite a long time. If you need to, you can thin it with water. Um, I didn't do it for this project. And basically it's just a case of putting it on and making sure all of the sculptor mold and all of the um, acrylic paint that I've put on is covered. You can put it on gently with you know a paintbrush or a spatula or something. I find it easy just to whack it all on and spread it out. And obviously this paintbrush is not going to be much use afterwards. Again, just making sure it goes right to the edges. I'm not really concerned if it goes on the picture frame because again, it can, it's acrylic, so it can be wiped off really easily with water. And here, though I'm going right to the edge and I'm making uh, horizontal strokes, sort of across the road direction. Once I've got it right to the edge, I'm going to make vertical strokes again so that all of the, um, the strokes of the brush go along the road. And this is where I'm going to start to get rid of that straight edge that the grass had. Basically by taking the mud right to the edge of the grass and then also taking it beyond a little bit as well. The idea is that basically where the road is, perhaps there was once grass, but it's just been uh, eroded away by vehicles. And then I thought just to break it up a little bit, I just put a couple of stones in there. Uh, these are woodland scenic stones, I think. Though obviously stones are free if you go outside and find them. And then just covering those a little bit in mud. Now before the acrylic mud dries, it's time to put the vehicle in. I know various people screw their vehicles to the base or whatever, or leave them loose. I'm just going to put this into the mud and I'm going to use the mud to hold it in place. So at the moment I'm just making sure that I've got the right position and then moving it back because obviously the vehicle is driven to this position so it needs to have left some tracks. Now because I put the mud on quite thin, uh, the vehicle isn't really sort of sinking into the mud, it isn't really showing the weight of the vehicle. Uh, so there's a few things I can do to uh, fix that. And the easiest one, which I haven't filmed very well at all here, is to put a layer of mud on the bottom of the tracks of the vehicle, hopefully fairly thick. And then the idea of that is, if you've got quite thick mud on the bottom, when you put the vehicle back down and you push it onto the diorama, that mud sort of squidges out of the side and it gives the impression that the vehicle is sunk into the mud.
There we go. That's a bit hard to see on this camera angle, but squidging has occurred. And then I can just tidy it up a little bit, smooth it down if needed. And again, the cleanup is really easy just with a damp cloth or damp tissue. You can just wipe the mud off, obviously, before it's dried. And I just pushed a few of the same rocks that I used on the road into the grass as well. And then one of the things about the Vallejo mud is that it's a very consistent colour, which is not very realistic. So I'm using another product from Vallejo. This is their Russian uh, thick mud. And I'm just putting some small amounts of that only in the ruts where the vehicle is currently uh, positioned. The idea being that the, the deeper mud is perhaps a darker colour than the mud on the surface. So it's just been churned up by the vehicle. And I put a little bit on the, track, on the uh, wheel assemblies here as well. You've got to be careful with this colour because it's really, really dark. It's quite dominant. And then finally, just to uh, try to break up the mud a little bit more, I just used some Tamiya XF52, which is flat earth, and just with a very dry brush, just run the brush over just to pick out the highlights. And then one more final touch, I wanted a little bit of water, not too much. So this is Woodland Scenics uh, Scenic Water. And I'm putting literally just one or two drops just to make not even really significantly sized puddles, just tiny, tiny little puddles where there's a little bit of water. Now where I do want some water is just along inside the vehicle track, but I don't want to get any on the vehicle itself. So, so a good little trick to achieve that is to use something like this, which is a um, barbecue skewer. And basically hold that at an almost vertical angle and basically just put the drop of uh, scenic water onto that and it should run down Yes, perfect. It's quite a neat little trick, I like that. And you can also use a skewer as well just to sort of pull the water into places where it should be. Okay, so here are the figures attached to the base. Basically, I super glued uh, their feet down one at a time and just really pushed the figure into the terrain. Uh, the first couple were quite easy. It got a little bit harder for the third and fourth figures because at that point you're kind of putting a little bit of torque and a little bit of tension on the other figures. But they've all managed to stay down, touch wood, and uh, I'm quite happy with the result. So this is the almost finished diorama. Why is it not finished? And there's just one small touch I want to add. I would like to have, I think, something in this corner here so I'm going to add this sea foam tree which I made. I think that just sort of completes that a little bit there, kind of a late summer autumn style um, tree. If you want to know how I made these trees, then look out for a video which will be coming up in the next couple of days when I'll show you how to make different types of trees and bushes from sea foam. And here is the final diorama. Okay, so thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the construction of this diorama. If you have, then please consider liking the video, subscribing or sharing.
And if you haven't liked the video, then please feel free to leave some constructive criticism in the comments below. Say what you liked, what you thought could be improved. Modeling is a learning process, so it's always good to hear what people think. And if you missed some earlier parts of the video, uh, there should be a link in the top right now to part one, where I built the ambulance. And there should be a link now to part two, where I painted and weathered it. And there'll be a video coming up shortly showing you how to make the seafoam tree which I added.